Amen. Please have a seat. Good morning. Chained to a wall, not for the first time, but for the last time, the Apostle Paul says this, for I have already been poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has come. But I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course, I have kept the faith, and there is laid up for me in heaven a crown of righteousness that the Lord himself, the righteous judge, will give to me, now get this, but not only to me, but to all who have loved his appearing. He's saying to us, guys, it is a fight for faith. Walking with Jesus in this world has always been difficult. But if you invest well, the eternal reward is glorious. So he's asking us today, are we ready for this? That's what we're calling this series. Are we ready to really walk with Jesus? Right? And specifically in the passage we're going to look at today in 2 Timothy chapter 3, so you can open your Bibles there if you'd like. That's where we're going to spend most of our time today. He's going to remind us that it only gets worse till it gets great. I know that doesn't sound like a very uplifting message, but it is the message that he has for us today. And it's the truth, and it should encourage us. So in today's question that I hope to a- that I'm asking and hope to answer today is how do we focus on heaven in a world that is fixated on hell? How do we focus on heaven in a world that is fixated on hell? Guys, there are two ways to live. And we can either get sucked into the world system and down into hell... Or we can, in his power, together by his strength, together as his people, be the light and salt he's called us to be and keep looking up. Those are the two options we've got as followers of Christ. So today I ask the question, how do we stay focused on heaven in a world that is fixated on hell? Our passage is going to give us four ways we do that. So if you would, open up your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3. And we're going to pick it up where we left off last week at the end of chapter 2. And the first thing he's going to tell us is that we need to know what is coming. Look at how he starts this, what we call chapter 3. This is a message not just to Timothy, but it's to all the people in the churches throughout history. And he says, but realize, take note of this, that in the last days difficult times will come. I'm going to stop right there. That's the first point. Should not be a, Brian talked about it during the invocation. Should not be a surprise to us. He prayed it. Paul tells us right here, difficult times will come. Now, lest we think that this is just a man who's sort of, because of his circumstances, chained to a wall, he's like, yeah, of course difficult times are going to come. My life is living proof. Let's go back and look at Luke's account of what Brian read to us during our invocation. So we're going to come back to 2 Timothy, obviously, but turn to the left of where we are, to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21. And I want you to hear these words that are real similar to Paul's right out of the mouth of our Savior. We tend to sugarcoat the teaching of Jesus too much. It's all love and, and, and warm and fuzzy and like rainbows and unicorns. And yet, this is Jesus in Jerusalem for the last time, days before he's going to be crucified, and he knows it. Just like Paul, who knew the end of his life was coming, and he's telling us these in a very passionate way, here's what you need to hold on to, church. Jesus is saying, my time is short. Here's what you need to remember. So I'm going to pick it up in verse 1 of 21, and I'm going to read a large chunk of this, because it's the word of the Lord. And it says, And he, Jesus, looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts in the treasury, and he saw a poor widow putting in two small copper coins. And he said, truly I say to you, this poor widow put more than all of them. For they, out of their surplus, put in the offering. But she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. And while some were talking about the temple, that it was adorned with beautiful stones and votive gifts, he said, as for these things that you're looking at, the day will come when they will not be, when there will not be one stone upon another, which will not be torn down. They questioned him, saying, Teacher, when therefore will these things happen? 
And what will, be, what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? They want to know, just like we do, how do we know when the end is coming? And he said, see to it that no one misleads you, for many will come in my name saying, I am he, and the time is near. Do not go after them. There's going to be many false prophets. When you hear of wars and disturbances, do not be terrified, for these things must take place, but the end does not immediately follow. Then he continued by saying to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be a great earthquake, and in various places plagues and famines, and there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you. He's speaking to us, guys. This is a message for us. And he will persecute you, delivering you to the synagogues and the prisons, bringing you before the kings and the governors for my name's sake. And get this, I love verse 13. And it, this persecution, will lead to an opportunity for your testimony. So make up your minds now to, not to prepare beforehand, for, to, to, I'm sorry, to defend yourself. I will give you the utterances and wisdom which no opponent will be able to resist or refute. But you will be betrayed by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. And you will be hated by all because of my name. Yet not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. Now, guys, again, I, I get that this is not an uplifting message. This is, this is Christ's message to us. We need to be ready by knowing what's coming, and he's telling them, here's what's going to come. Now, in the interest of time, skip down to verse 25. There will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars, blood moon, red moon, this moon, that moon, all these things that you see. You know, people are posting YouTube, this means it's the end, this means it's the end. Nobody knows the end. Nobody knows. Just nobody. There's nobody out there on the internet that has figured out when he's coming. Because if they did, then Christ's a liar. Because he says, nobody knows. Not even, he didn't know while he was here. Men, will, men faint from fear and expectation of these things which are coming upon the world, but the, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see, you know, this is what he's coming. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and great glory. But when these things begin to take place, straighten up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Guys, this is where I get my little tagline on my emails and things, keep looking up. This is the posture we as believers are supposed to have. We are not supposed to look around and bite our nails and fret and worry because the world is going to hell. Right? The world is going to hell and we're the light to, to try to pull them out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. But our posture is supposed to be straighten up and lift your heads. Not huddle up and hunker down. Right? That's what we're supposed to look like and I'm excited for the series we're going to go into after we get through um, in, in the Second Timothy study, where we get through Revel or we're going to go through Revelation and Daniel, and we're going to look at how those books are in the Bible to encourage us to do just what Christ is telling us, to keep looking up. Guys, why do we feel the need to sugarcoat the gospel? Why does the church feel the need to do that? Peter, who's writing to a church that's being persecuted in the first century, about the same time Paul is writing, he says in 1 Peter 4, don't be surprised at the fiery trials that, are, that you're undergoing, like something strange is happening to you, but to the degree that you share in the suffering of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that at his appearing, you will have even more exaltation. And then at the end of that letter, in one of my favorite verses in the Bible, 1 Peter 5.10, 1 Peter 5.10, write it down, look it up later. But you, after you have suffered for a little while, this is who he's talking to, he's talking to us, after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. That's his promise to us. That's what we need to cling to. Guys, none of the apostles at the end of their life, all of whom died badly, like in a gruesome way, except John. And he was only boiled in oil and then thrown on an island in, in seclusion. So that didn't really end well for him either. Not one of them got to the last day of their life, including the Apostle Paul, and said, I wish I had a do-over. If I could do it over again, I'd never follow that guy. Only one said that. Judas, I wish I had a do-over. Every other one said, you know what, it's hard. It was hard, but I know it was worth it. That's the attitude we need to have. And knowing what is to come will help. Because we need to know what's coming. And we need to know that he knows and is not surprised by what's coming. 
We need to cling to verses in the Bible like Isaiah 41. We're surrounded by ISIS. Right? It's literally surrounded by, the, by what we call ISIS today. Isaiah says to Hezekiah, or God says through Isaiah to Hezekiah the king, says, do not fear for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you because I'm your God. Surely I will help you. Surely I will strengthen you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That's our God. That's what we need to remember. So how do we stay focused on heaven in a world that is fixated on hell? One, we have to know what's coming. The second thing is we have to recognize the foolishness of the world's folly. So go back to 2 Timothy. I think I left you in Luke. Go back to 2 Timothy and let's look at the next few verses together. This is what he says is going to happen in these difficult times. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Guys, like, like he wrote that in like 68 AD. Could he not have just written that yesterday? Has anything changed? No. And then he says, holding to a form of godliness, so religious pretension, having denied its power, avoid such men as these. For among them are those who enter the household of, households of captive weak women, weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth. Men of depraved mind, rejected in, God, in regard to the faith, rejected in regard to the faith, sorry, but they will not make further progress for their folly will be obvious to all, just as Janus and Jambres' folly was also. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this point because the last two weeks and next week really tie this in together well, but I just want to ask you three simple questions about this point of recognizing the, recognizing the foolishness of the world's folly. One, who are you looking at? Who are you? I'm asking everybody here. Child, old, young. When you're on social media, when you're watching te your favorite show or your movies on television, when you're reading your favorite authors, when you're walking around your campuses or your place of work, who are you looking at? Who are you fixated on? That is who you will become. Second part of that, second question, who do you want to be like? Because what starts to happen is you start, you look at these people, these situations, these lifestyles, and you start to want to be like them. Why? Why do you want to be like them? What is it about them that you find appealing? Do they tickle your ears? Guys, the church is full of people today, on Sunday, who are in churches because they want to have their ears tickled instead of having their hearts torn open by the Word of God. That's the truth. And it should grieve us all. It leads me to my third question, my last question. What do you see in their lives? So what are you looking at? Who do you want to be like? I want to be like this person. Maybe you're walking around your campus at school and you're like, I really want to be like that person is. But ask why. What is the fruit that you see? Is it because they're popular? Maybe it's in your place of business. You're like, I want to be like that person. Is it because they have a lot of money? Is it because they're successful? By whose standard? If Jesus were to come to you and ask, so why do you want to be like them? Would you have a good answer? Or is the pursuit of godliness so evident in their life that he wouldn't even need to ask the question? He'd just be like, yeah, go be like them. Follow them as they're following me. So today's question, how do we stay focused on heaven in a world fixated on hell? First, we have to know what's coming. Second, we have to recognize the foolishness of the world's folly. Our third point is we have to expect no less than our Savior received. Expect no less than our Savior received. Look at the next four verses. Verse 10. Now, or some translators will say, but you followed my... So, so don't follow these... Guys, he's saying, Timothy, Doug, hard times are coming. You got to know that. 
Here's, what hard here's why hard times are coming. Because people are going to spread lies. The world is full of lies. Then he turns to this. But you follow my teaching, my conduct, my purpose. That's my aim in life is what that word actually means. My faith, my patience, my love, my perseverance. And oh, by the way, that those led to persecutions and suffering such as happened to me in Antioch, in Iconium, and in Lystra. What persecutions I endured and out of them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be, not may be, not some might be, all will be persecuted. But evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Because he's telling us, he's telling each of us here, guys, you followed my teaching. Here, here's, what, here's what my life looked like. And here's what it led to. If that was true, in, and we know what it led to in Christ's life, getting crucified. If that was true for, for Jesus, and it was true for Paul, why would we expect any different? And why would the church teach any different? Why would the church teach some sort of prosperity gospel? Put on Jesus and your life is just going to get better. There is some truth in there, and we'll get there in a minute, but guys, the idea that somehow the reason we come to Christ is so that our marriages will be stronger or our children will be better behaved is just a lie from the pit of hell. We come to Christ because he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. That's the reason, right? The problem is we, all of us, can unknowingly buy into the prosperity gospel at some level, right? We, without, I mean, you may not go, oh, like, I, I, I'm going to go send money to these people because God's going to double it back, but that, that's, that's like the extreme version, right? The Benny Hinn version of the prosperity gospel. But guys, it could be just something as simple as, hey, you know what? I, I, I'm trying to live well for God, so why is my marriage still struggling? So this thing isn't working for me, so I'm out, right? That's a way that we buy into, in little subtle ways, the prosperity gospel. That my life is still hard, so Jesus just must not be doing it for me. And yet we know from Christ's life and Paul's life that, guys, some, that, that, that the love of God does not inoculate us from suffering. We know that from Jesus. I mean, didn't Jesus love the Father? Didn't Paul love Jesus? Yeah, and they both suffered severely. We should expect that. Guys, write this down. If you are following Christ so your life will be better, you've got the wrong guy. If you're following Christ so your life will be better, you've got the wrong man. He doesn't say that. Now, guys, your outlook should be better. When struggles come, we should consider it all joy because we know that it's not about now. We know that, that those struggles are producing in us an eternal way to glory far beyond all comparison. For we don't fix our eyes on the things that are seen, our struggles and, and, the, and the, the envy that we feel about all the things that other people are getting to have and do that we see on social media and the media and whatever, but we fix our eyes on the things above, not the things of this earth. Guys, look at me. Everybody look at me. Faith may be born in joy, but it is forged in suffering. Faith may be born in joy, but it is forged. It is made strong in suffering. And I'll let you know a little secret. That's why God causes it in your life. Doesn't just allow it, causes it. Not everything you suffer is his, his doing. Most of it's your own. Most of it's my own. Most of the things I suffer through are my bad choices. But God allows suffering in our lives. He causes suffering in our lives because that's where faith is forged. It's not in that high mountaintop experience. It's down in the valley when you've got no place else to look but up that you see him is just better.
so how do we fix our eyes on heaven in a world that is fixated on hell? Here's the last point, and it's the most important. We have to embrace our Bibles. We have to embrace the Word of God. That's what Paul's going to tell us. So let's look and see how he does it. So remember he said, hard times are coming. Know it. They're coming because the world is full of foolishness and folly. Don't listen to it. You know my life. It's not about my, circum my, my circumstances. Do not convey whether faith is real or not. We live by faith, not by sight. And then he finishes it up with, and oh, by the way, know the word of God. He says, you, are, you however, verse 14, you, however, continue in the things that you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you've learned them, that from your childhood you have known the sacred writings, which are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation. So he's saying, because he's going to say, from your childhood, because your, your mom was a Jew, you've known the Old Testament that revealed Christ. And then he says, all Scripture, verse 16, all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that, so that the man of God, that's the man and woman of God, might be adequate and equipped for every good work. Now, some of you have been here a while. If you've been at Cornerstone a while, you're like, oh no, here comes Doug's soapbox. Probably, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not going to apologize for it. This is, this is, this is all, I, I know I sound like a broken record, being in God's word every day, being in God's word. Guys, it's the only one that plays. When times get hard, that record is the only one. Being in God's word every day on your own is the only one that's going to sing a song to your soul that's going to make any difference for eternity. That's it. That's, that's the deal. That's all I got. This is it. Anything that comes out of this mouth that, isn't, that doesn't flow from this book, you shouldn't listen to. That's just, the, that's just the, the God's honest truth. Guys, the, contrary to what the world is telling us, the truth is not found within you. And it is not fluid. The truth is outside of you. And it is fixed. The truth is not found within you. And it's fluid. It can change. The truth is outside of you. And it's fixed. And praise God for that. Guys, can you imagine if for, for centuries people figured out how to navigate the globe by looking at where the North Star is? Right? And so they found America, and then they could find their way back. How? Because the North Star was fixed. Now what if somewhere down the road somebody said, you know what, that, that North worked for them then, but it doesn't work for me now. So North is now over here. We'd still be like writing on stone tablets or something. Right? I mean, imagine if, if, if what we lived by in, in things outside of the Word of God, could just change whenever we felt like they, what we wanted them to change. Fixed things like north or gravity. What if it, we just went, but guys, that's what's happening to the Word of God today. Ah, that doesn't really work for us anymore. So let's change it. That's what all those people that he's talking about in verses 3 through 9 are, are doing. So how do we know that we believe Verses 16 and 17. How do we know that we, how do we know we believe? How do we know we're living like we believe? Verses 16, through seven, 16 and 17. That all scripture is inspired by God. It's breathed out by God. It was breathed out by, by the Holy Spirit through men. And we now have it preserved for us by that same God today in what we call the Bible. How do we know we really, we're living like we believe that? That it's profitable for training and for reproof and for correction and for, and for righteousness. How do we know that? Here's one way you know. You don't have to be convinced by me to be in your Bible every day. Guys, if, if, you're, if you're tired of hearing this message, 
I'll, I'll give you a, an easy way of, of the message of, you know, you need to be in the Word every day, you need to be in the Word every day, you be, be in the Word every day. <laughs> Honestly. Guys, I, even in a church like ours, where this has been our soapbox since day one, a fraction of you are in God's Word every day. A small percentage. And in most churches, they don't even bring their Bibles anymore. To Sunday, let alone open it Monday through Saturday. Guys, how do we know we believe this? We'll know it when we realize that the wisest teaching there can be isn't what some TED Talk dude is talking about or what some YouTube video is showing me, but the wisest teaching there is is right here in this book. We'll know that the best reproof, we can, the most loving reproof, which just means, it's just God's way of saying, no, don't do that. That's what reproof is. The, the, the most loving reproof is in the word. That we know that the best correction, because God doesn't just reprove us or slap our hands, but he corrects us. So he's saying, here's the way to live. Teaching. Here's the, don't do that. Don't, 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 Doug, don't do that. That's reproof. Correction. Do this instead. Do this instead, that, that we would realize that, that this is where I learned that. Guys, not by getting a list of, how, of do's and don'ts, but by seeing how Jesus did it. By seeing how he's telling us just to live our lives. But I get a little ahead of myself there. That it is the most powerful training in the world is found in this book because this is Jesus revealed. And so when you're in it, you become more like him. That's the best, the best training any of us can have is to end up looking more like Jesus Christ. I'm going to say that again because you're going to say amen after it. The best training we can have is to look more like Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you. But guys, I'm not here to promote a book. I'm not here to say, you need to be, guys, if you need some good reading for the summer, come talk to me afterwards. I'll be happy to suggest a book. This is not a book. Right? This is not a self-help book. This is not a how to win at life book. Guys, this is not basic instructions even for, for before you leave earth. This is not a book about how to live your life. This is God's revelation about God. This is the revealed Savior. It's not, guys, we marvel at, at Avengers Endgame. You see what I did there? Wow, you got that better than I thought you would. We marvel at the, at the movie Avengers. And, and, and it, was a, it was a really good seven or eight hour movie. It was. Right? But why do we marvel? You know why? Because for 10 years, these people took 21 movies and put them together and told one story. And, we're all, and it all comes together in Avengers Endgame. And you're like, wow, that's really cool how they do that. Guys, I'll let you a little secret. This book right here, is a much, one, the end game is way better. Like the end of the game is way better. But two, this book was written not over 10 years, but written over 1,500 years. Not by a few guys in some, some studio like conference room, but it was written by 40 different men living on three different continents, speaking three different languages. And it tells one story. And guys, I love you enough to tell you it isn't about you. It tells one story, and it's his story. But we've turned this in to this self-help book, because there is a lot of help here. There's, there, this, this is the roadmap for life. But it's not diving into it and going, how do I find out about what to do about my marriage? It's going, how do I gaze upon the beauty that is Jesus Christ, that he might become, that I might look more like him as he conforms me into his image? That's what this book is about. That's why it matters that we're in it every day. Guys, it will bless you if you're in it every day. It will help you. It will strengthen you. It will punch you in the face. But it will also show you that you are fully known. That you are fully known by the God of the universe and yet deeply loved. Because there's no other book in the world like it. Because you get to behold the beauty and the majesty that is God and hear the message that he loves you enough to send his son to die for you. 
Now, some of you are sitting here today and you're like, Doug, I get it. I've heard this soapbox, but I don't know how to get anything out of this book. I, it just isn't speaking to me. Starting in a couple weeks, on every fellowship Sunday, I will sit down at the table while we're having a meal together and, I will, and, and we will walk together on how you, can, how you can see Jesus in this book. For anybody that wants to come. Because guys, it will supernaturally change your life. Look at me. Look at me. To say that you are a Christian and rarely be in God's word on your own is to bring into question the profession of faith. I'm going to say it again so I can be clear. To say that you are a Christian, I don't care if you attend here faithfully every Sunday. The most dangerous thing you could do is attend here every Sunday and never open the Bible on your own. Because it brings into question whether you're truly a believer in Jesus Christ. And you say, wait a minute. What about all those people in the world that are professing believers, but they don't have access to the Bible? Let me show you a short video that tells you a little bit about what they do when they get the word. That footage was taken by a missionary from China who smuggled some Bibles in and then smuggled the video out. Because we have Bibles laying around our house collecting dust. We have access to them on our fingertips, literally. And we're too busy to be in it. These people had professed faith in Christ and they'd never heard the Word of God. They'd never been able to see the Word of God on their own. And to have a Bible was more precious than anything they could imagine. There's a story I had to read in one of the books I'm I was taking in school this last semester about a POW in Vietnam. And I'll give you the short version of the story, but what, what he found out through a series of events was that the soldiers were using pages of the Bible to wipe themselves after going to the bathroom. And he learned that because they told him he had to go in there and clean the buckets that they would go to the bathroom in. So what did that man do from then on? He started getting himself in trouble on purpose so he could go in there, pick pages of the Bible out of human excrement, scrape it off so he could have the Word of God. Man, is that us? If not, why? What's it going to take? Like, what's it going to take for these verses to be your reality? A, a group from the International Bible Society did a national study over North America. They, they surveyed thousands of people over several years, and then they calculated, they, they took all the data, and their question was, how does being in God's Word every day, or how does being in God's Word affect your life? affect your marriage, affect your outlook, affect your joy, affect your depression, and, all, and, and, they would, and people would, would rate a scale. Here's what they discovered. Going, being in God's Word one day a week, and that included a church on Sunday, being in God's Word one day a week had zero impact. Being in God's Word two days a week, so maybe you're in church on Sunday, that's one day, and, and one day you're in a small group, that's your second day. Zero impact. The needle started to move when people were in it, on, when people were in the Word on a third day. There was a little bit of movement in the percentages. But when people said, and this was all self-reported, they said, I'm in God's word four or more days a week. Here's what happened. Feeling lonely dropped 30%. Anger dropped 
32%. Bitterness in relationships, including marriage, parenting, etc., dropped 40%. Feeling spiritually stagnant dropped 60%. Areas of sin, like struggling with pornography, dropped 62%. That's the difference between just showing up on Sunday and you being in God's Word every day on your own. Oh, by the way, they went on to say, sharing your faith, what Brian and Lori did such a great job talking about today, sharing your faith increased by 200%. Just discipling other people increased by 260%. Why? Because we don't think we ought to disciple because we don't know the word. Well, be in the word. Get the word into you and then let him get it into others through you. Because this is the, those numbers, and I'll probably use them again next week. Those numbers are not just me talking or some seminary talking. Or th those are actually those are those are just real Christians responding to a survey. This is the diff the, the supernatural power of being in God's Word every day. It will change your life. You guys, remember where we started. How are we going to live? focused on heaven in a world that is fixated on hell. How is the church going to survive? Because we're either going to get sucked into the world system and down into hell, or we are going to rally together. We're going to encourage one another. We're going to pour over his word together and on our own, and we're going to keep looking up. Right? It happens because we know what's coming. It's because we recognize that the world is full of of folly and goes, well, it does go somewhere. It's going straight to hell apart from Jesus Christ. That we should not only endure persecution, but we should expect it. We should embrace it because it's in producing in us perfection. It's making us more like Christ. And then we need to embrace our Bibles. Guys, there are only two teams in the world. From the gospel's perspective, there are no races of people. There are no national identities from the gospel's perspective. And there's no middle to ground. There are only people who have placed their lives in the pierced hands of Jesus Christ. And there are those people who on the last day will give an account and be without excuse. That's it. That's all there is. And if you're in that first camp where you've placed your faith in the hands of Christ, he is compelling us to get to know him better and to share him more. Let's pray. So Father, I thank you, Lord, for your living and active word. Lord, I want to pray right now that you would give us a hunger for it. That's a supernatural thing. I know that. I know that from personal experience that only you can give people a hunger for you. And if they hunger for you, they will be in your word because that's where you are. You have not left us here alone. You have sent your spirit to live inside us when we come to know your son who came and lived and died and rose again and sent his spirit to live in us and you've given us your word which is profitable for teaching and for reproof and for correction and for training in righteousness so that every man and woman of God might be adequate and equipped for every good work. So where are we? Where are you? What camp are you in? And if you don't have a hunger for his word, I would evaluate which camp you think you're in. And I beg you to come talk to me. Talk to Brian. Talk to Jeff. Talk to one of the leaders. Talk, guys, talk to somebody sitting next to you. There are a ton of people in this place that would love to tell you 
about Jesus Christ and the power His Word can have in your heart. Father, I do pray that You would stir our hearts to live for You. That You would change our focus so that we would not look around at the world's ways and their follow its folly right into the pit of hell. But that we would fix our gaze on Jesus Christ, the author, the one who started our faith, and the one who will finish it as we run this race. Lord, I pray that each of us would leave here today encouraged encouraged by this, the words of this amazing man of faith who lived what he wrote. That we would be encouraged to live for something and someone so much bigger than us. That we would not waste time on pettiness or foolishness but on the things that are eternal. That every time we fix our eyes on your word, we are fixing our eyes on heaven. Every time we speak your truth to the soul of another human being, we are fixated on heaven. And the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of your glory and grace. So let us be encouraged, Lord. Let us be strengthened and let us be bold for the sake of the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen.